Ladies and gentlemen, stick around. We've got Ideas by Elliot. Hey, folks, you're listening to Ideas by Elliot. And we're here with Ideas by Elliot. Podcast, podcast, (laughs) podcast. You're rolling. I am here with Evan Hutzek. Did I say that right? Not quite. Quite close. Hutzek. 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 Okay, so I even put a little pronunciation guide in it, but that's probably not accurate. And you are here today because you're running for city council in what district? I'm running for city council in District 2 on the east side. Okay, and so whereabouts is that? One of the best descriptors is um, on the west, going up and down Alpine Drive, the neighborhoods around Edison, and then to the south. Uh, our south, southern border consists of Greenbrier, Teresa Drive. Uh, to the east, we run along the west side, the left side of Huron Road, and we stop just short of the neighborhoods prior to Humboldt. Okay. Indigo Bluff, the ponds, that area. So my mom and dad live at the end of Newberry Avenue to the east. Is that in your district or not? I don't New- think it is. Newberry Part of Newberry is, I'm guessing they fall into District 5, which would be remember. Dave Nennings. I feel district. like I should know, but I don't remember. Um, okay, and you have a competitor. You want to call them out by name? You want to say anything about that Well, I'm right off the cuff? I'm running against a 10-year incumbent, City Council President Tom DeWayne, uh, which draws an interesting reaction from people. Um, of course, a lot of people ask you, well, do you, do you consider yourself an underdog in this? You know, is this, and I've responded to people, I, I don't see it as David versus Goliath. I certainly don't see it as Rocky Balboa versus the uh Is it Batman intimidated. versus Robin? I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even say that. Uh, <laughs> Batman versus Superman, I don't know. But uh, ulti- oh. ultimately, I'll tell you what, I do not feel like an underdog in this race. Uh, having gotten out there, knocked on the doors, talked to the residents of the district, um, I think we have done a great job so far and will continue until April 5th of articulating the real differences between my opponents and I, and I'm very certain that when one takes the time to see the differences between the two of us, particularly regarding our vision for Green Bay and ultimately what, how we view Green Bay's ceiling for potential, I, I certainly do not feel like an underdog in this case, and the reaction to my candidacy has been anything, it's been encouraging to say the least. So it's no secret that Dwayne had uh, some uh, uh, negative feelings toward how much we were spending uh, as a city on downtown. So uh, how would you contrast with that? Well, I, th- I think it's, it's dangerous. And, of course, my opponent did run two unsuccessful mayoral campaigns, largely focused on the fact that, you know, almost, almost attacking our downtown – uh, running on this notion, which is just false, that the mayor only cares about downtown, that nothing is happening across the rest of the city. Look at where the development is occurring. We have development citywide. We have development in District 2. Uh, the industrial park, the I-43 industrial park, is in our district. And drive around, there is growth across the city. I think what's really dangerous is that he, along with a couple other aldermen, have almost politicized our development, politicized our downtown. And this is very dangerous for two reasons, in my opinion. I think we have to continue, keep the ga- keep the pedal on the gas with our downtown right now in particular. We all know that the much-anticipated Town District is coming in in Ashwaubenon, and it would be a tragedy if we don't keep up the momentum downtown, continue our development, and two, three years from now with the, lo- the launch of the title town district in Ashwaubenon have that really suck the life out of our downtown. That would be devastating to our tax base, to jobs on so many levels. And number two, what I think I understand and my opponent doesn't is how essential downtown success is to everybody citywide. There's no better place in this city to rapidly expand our tax base and grow our tax base as a city than downtown. It's the most it's the greatest place for revenue in our tax base. And what's so essential about our tax base? Well, when you look at property taxes, there's no better there's no better weapon out there to counter property taxes than a higher tax base for the city. 
in addition to that, maintaining services is directly impacted by a city's tax base. So I, I disagree wholeheartedly on this assertion that we need to almost pull out of the downtown. So you said something interesting there. You said that the best way to uh, access tax revenues in the downtown. I'm paraphrasing. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Why is that? Well, why do you feel that I way? think when you just look at how things are zoned with businesses, there is, there is not going to be any greater concentration of businesses that are going to create large tax base than in downtown as opposed to, say, mixed use where you may have a lot of residential development and some some commercial development in other parts of the city. And I think what's proven when you look at what's going on on University Avenue, District 2 has developments in the I-43 Industrial Park. We have the the mental health facility moving in that my opponent actually voted against in his own district. We had Aurora Hospital um, through Bolt Construction invest a couple million in expanding. I think it's a fact what we need is to keep the pedal on the gas with our downtown, but also with a thriving a thriving city, it's a simple fact. A thriving city needs a thriving downtown. And with just like the body, when you have a healthy heart and you're healthy on the inside, the rest is going to benefit. And I think we're seeing I think we're seeing the fruits of that labor right now. Well and uh I I guess uh I don't like to inject my opinion too much, but uh uh, you know, we are a city that gets featured on national television, and they do showcase our downtown all the time. Uh, you know, I hail from the Broadway district, and uh, we get Monday Night Football images of of our of our district there all the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're not Appleton, we're not Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, I think some of those arguments could maybe be said in those types of communities, but we're uh, Green Bay is unique. Absolutely. I, one thing I certainly believe in, though, as you touched on a few other cities, I think sometimes we have too narrow-minded of a vision thinking that we can't look outside of our own city to see what other cities have done for success. When I One major platform that I have is making Green Bay a true destination point, a destination point for businesses, for families, and young professionals. I do think it's important at times that we look outside, look at other mid-sized metropolitan areas in the Midwest, see what they've accomplished of the downtown in their own respective downtown. One example is Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a city that might not ring a bell to a lot of people, but I would I would challenge anyone go online and see what they have done with their downtown. It is truly breathtaking. And when you consider all the factors that Green Bay has going for it, we're very, we're strategically we're much more strategically located than a lot of other mid-sized cities in the Midwest with major hubs only a few hours away. Um, that coupled with the leverage of having one of the most recognizable sport franchises in the world, I think we need individuals on the city council that, again, have a very high ceiling for this city and what we're capable of. So uh, the uh, I oftentimes in politics, uh, people talk about uh, you know in terms of education or uh, you know different policies regarding children, and they always mm-hmm. use the phrase "if even one child," right? And uh, as if like we can never spend enough. We can spend it. We have unlimited amounts of money that we can spend. So, in your view, how much is too much, or is there no uh, is there no ceiling? Because you mentioned the ceiling word there. So, are we are we near the ceiling? Should we just keep the 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 foot on the gas, like you were saying, or do we need to increase it? Do we need to step on the gas? Well, and how another, do we know? Another part. Another part of my. Another part of my platform is fiscal responsibility. I think it's very important in this city. We've seen it right now where there's a great debate on the um, sales tax return, and also recent projects have been proposed that could potentially result in the city borrowing hundreds of thousands of dollars annually for these projects. I do believe fiscal responsibility is important. Now, with regard to our downtown development, I with saying how much is too much with a dollar sign, well, I don't, I don't think you can put a price tag on your development. Uh, I certainly want to see as much invested from the private sector as possible, uh, but ultimately what gets lost a lot of times is the fact that creating that whole environment, it's one thing that cannot be underscored. 
when people come to a city, and one thing that I firmly believe, we need to create a city that offers a wide variety of amenities. The downtown has some great things going for it right now, but again, there's those that envision, I think they top out on a ceiling where their crown jewel for our downtown was, well, a Walmart. Um, I know myself, and I believe the majority of my Cons- hopefully wow. future constituents so I, w- I was pretty c- I was pretty central to that. I don't think anybody thought of that as a crown jewel. I, I really don't think that there was anybody saying, it, boy, if we have a Walmart, we're set. I don't think there's anybody saying that. Um, well, and my, and my point being with that was I think we have a lot of great things going in the downtown. However, one thing that a lot of other downtowns have that we need to strive for is we have great things like a farmer's market, a lot of activities that are accessible to a large percentage of the population a given time of the year. But what I think every truly thriving downtown area needs are are institutions, places that can be utilized by a high percentage of the population um, on a year-round basis, preferably. And I think when you ask the question of how much is too much or do you have a limit, I think we've got a great We've got a great amount of supporting businesses downtown, but what we need to do is look at and very judiciously say, what what else can we put in our downtown to really take that next step? So are you in favor of that uh, the stadium thing? As I discussed at the forum that we had um, the previous Tuesday, there's a lot to like about it. I like the end result. My largest concern, I think we need to be very judicious, And we need to make sure that if we're going ahead with this, that it is the best possible deal for the taxpayers and residents of Green Bay. I don't think any time that we're talking about fast-tracking something that would cost the city um, up to $8 million initially, that's, that's serious. There are a lot of important issues and things on the horizon that are going to cost a decent amount of money of investment in this city, everything from our pipes, our sewage, to our roads. I I certainly love the end result when I envision it, and I think it can be a great success, but I do think the upcoming council needs to convene and really look at the specifics of it and say to ourselves, you know, how are we going to how are we going to structure this that it's in the best interest of the city that that we don't take on too much. So uh, the uh, eight million dollar figure that you cited, uh, I I don't know what the actual numbers are are gonna pan out. Maybe nobody does, but let's go with that eight million. That's uh, we only have a hundred thousand people live here, so that's eighty bucks a piece, right? I'm not a math wizard, but I think that's eighty bucks a piece. That's a lot for a, a baseball thing that uh, you know is only going to be used a handful of times a year. They're they, they're talking about maybe they'll have soccer, maybe they'll have some other things. Um, now that I have like a visual number, uh, that's a lot of money. I can go to the I can go to the movies with my whole family for you know two times for that amount of money. It is, and I certainly love the idea when the idea of concerts are thrown out right along right along the river. I think that's a great thing to envision for our city, um, and I and I agree with you. Right now, that's a lot of money, so I have to, I have to take the position that. We have to make sure we get this right. If we go ahead with this, we have to make sure we get it right. There are some other concerns. I I know li- going to the listening sessions, the word minor league baseball was thrown out again and again and again, and I think it's important to address that, that the notion of minor league baseball. Now, this is an independent league. While it has been successful, many of us remember the fact that arena football, the AFL, was on NBC just a few years ago, and they are not in existence anymore. It, it's an independently owned league, and while I they've definitely been successful, I think it would be much more of a slam dunk, say, if we had a minor league team. Let's say we pulled a coup and we had the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers come up here, the Beloit Snappers, somebody who is an organization that, again, is part of a major league franchise. I think there's a big difference in that. And Again, it hammers home on the point that to rush this through, I think, would be a real disservice. And in talking with constituents, again, people are not opposed to the notion of having a baseball diamond down there, but I think it would, I would have a hard time explaining to future constituents um, that I fast-tracked this. 
Well, I mean, and I, I don't know that whether I'm against it or not. I don't know if you're really against it or not. But, uh, you know, when you said that $8 million number, uh, that really just hit home with me uh, because that 100000 figure, you know, includes, uh, you know, three people in my family. So that's actually 240 bucks out of our pocket. Um, that's a lot of money. And, uh, yeah, let's say we move the Timber Rattlers up here. I don't know that uh, that that's such a... I don't know that that's such a, a win for our overall community because you know then what happens to that stadium? Uh, and I don't I view I view us as you know one one community really between Green Bay and Appleton area. So uh, and I I love downtown and you know that that's Broadway district and I have a love for the Broadway district. But that's uh, uh, it's a little bit scary if we get on if we're on the hook for too much money. Yes. on top of the other spending. And I guess that kind of goes to that original question where, like, how much is too much? And even if it's $4 million, that's still a lot of money. Absolutely. And on top of all the other things. I think that was, I think that was um, again, I think we also need to, citywide, I have a position of we have to ask questions on upcoming developments and investments by the city of, the, the question of necessity versus luxury, I think one place that this has really manifested itself in a stark contrast between my opponent and I is Colburn Pool. Now, nobody is anti-pool. I think the notion of a community neighborhood pool that has served thousands and thousands and thousands of youth is a great thing. I think that's something very special that we need to preserve. However, when it was turned into this megalith, if you will, of a pool for swimming competitions. And initially, it had a price tag of $4.5 million. That has shot through the roof. Now, I thought that was unnecessary from the get-go. I just don't think it was fiscally wise. Uh, my opponent made the quote in the Press Gazette, when you talk about things that put a city on the map, this pool is one of them. Now, again, I hearken back to the idea of we need people with a high ceiling for the city. I don't. I don't foresee a pool that'll be utilized a couple months out of the year as really putting Green Bay on the map. I, I know I can't name a community in the world outside of maybe Wisconsin Dells where a pool yeah. puts you on the map. I mean, <laughs> it's it's a time of the year where, and I'm not anti-pool either. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> A swimmer, I am not, but that there is no there is no prejudice toward the pool because of my lack of swimming ability. Uh, but when you when you look at the facts, it was floated around four hundred thousand dollars of borrowing for the next twenty years. That's just at four point five million. And there's a couple simple facts that go along with it. YMCA's aren't going to swim there and pay some exorbitant fee when they have their own pools. Tundra Lodge is looking at an Olympic sized pool. You know, Michael Phelps and Ryan Lochte, I hate to say it, aren't coming to swim Olympic trials there. And again and again, I just think it's one of those issues where we need to ask ourselves necessity. I think necessity has to win out versus luxury. Well, and when we talk about large numbers like that and the uh, I'd like to, I'd rather spread, spread the risk out, I guess. Uh, you know, we are a small community, so even four million dollars, that's a lot of money. And when I think about what we could get bang for the buck in terms of either uh, youth community programs for that amount of money or uh, an entrepreneur fund where, you know, maybe we have like a Shark Tank style thing and we we give away, you know, forty hundred thousand uh, dollar grants to businesses as long as they locate in the city of Green Bay, you know, something like that. Boy, 40 new entrepreneurial businesses that I mean, you think about the price tag blows my mind. <laughs> well, that, absolutely. And that's and that's one thing I really I really believe with regard to our economic development. It's something that let's face it. I mean, everybody knows even in the job market applying for jobs, we are in an ultra competitive market. Mm -hmm. And and that's one thing when people say, well, I'll bring businesses to the city. I'll bring businesses to the city. Well, I think there's a couple things that are key to that. I I advocate economic development. I think we have great people in there right now, but we have had way too much turnover for a city of our size. People forget that we're a city of 100,000 people with an annual budget of $100 million. And I think we need to we need to address the turnover in economic development. I think our longest tenured person has been there approximately three years. What I would love to see is us us make sure that we have committed people who are committed to being there for the long haul because I truly believe that if you have committed people in economic development for the long haul that can execute a five, 10-year vision for the city, we're going to be better specifically regarding 
bringing well, in business. And, and I, I, I don't know who, who on the city council would uh, necessarily propose this, but I've heard that there are people that wanted to get rid of the economic development department my, entirely. My, uh, my opponent did vote to uh, basically to get rid of economic development, um, and it was going to essentially fall to the city planner. Now, I think this would have been incredibly – this just highlights how dangerous this would have been. Had we eliminated that position, our current – economic developer Kevin Vonk, who I think is doing an incredible job. Our city planner, when this would have been turned over, left us in 2015, uh, left for a different municipality. Is there any likelihood that Kevin, our current economic developer, would have stayed on in some sort of minor role? I think that's the notion that a city our size would not have separate departments, I think, is unacceptable. Uh, with regard to development, well, I don't know I, that the structure of it matters, but the it's the idea of the focus. Oh yes, right. And you know the same thing. Uh, it's being floated of merging the you know the the, the two downtown organizations, uh, downtown Green Bay and on Broadway. And I feel like the same thing applies there, where we uh, we are a small community. We are not going to attract Google to relocate to Green Bay, right? Mm-hmm. That's just not going to happen. So we need to be entrepreneurial. We need to we need to to cultivate small businesses. Yes. So as much focus as we can put on those things, we need, and we do need to attract some larger employers, some you know the large insurance companies, the things that are in our wheelhouse, healthcare, and you know all that kind of transportation, all that kind of stuff, right? So. Uh, all right, so I will. Uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit and uh, uh, ask you, what are some things that you feel that uh, City Council has done in the past that you think were good moves, and you want to join that club? Well, I I do believe that, and and there have been a lot of very contentious, uh, heated discussions on some issues. I think. I think the Walmart issue was one, for example, where I applaud people for thinking long-term, big picture, as opposed to just a short-term benefit. There's no doubt that the Walmart building would have provided some benefit initially. It, it was not an ugly building. I thought Walmart did work with the city. But when you're looking at that property, I think this goes to show we have uh, some individuals who have almost a they're willing to accept consolation prizes for this city. It goes back to the ceiling that they see for Green Bay. Recently, our city council and I applaud them for approving the transfer of the Larson Green property to DDL Holdings. Yeah. Now, this is something that's so, very essential. Okay, so because I was involved in that, I have to break in just a little bit. So uh, in regards to the Walmart thing, the, the, the Walmart was the only offer on the table mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, anybody who... Uh, says, well, we have a better thing now. Of course we do. Mm -hmm. And I love Brent, and I love uh, Titletown and Smet and DDL. Uh, That's great. They didn't have an offer on the table at the time of the Walmart thing. And I I agree that was one thing that was unfortunate during the whole debate. I wish that sometimes people become so focused on considering no a victory. I wish that – I do wish that some of the energy at that time – that was anti-Walmart had really been focused on what could we have done instead. And, and I didn't feel like there was a whole lot of that so, at the time. Um, and this is the problem with politics because it gets, you know, you can say no and really you're saying yes and it gets muddy and complicated. Uh, with with the Walmart issue in particular, um, nobody else was going to make a move until they saw what went down there. Because if... Um, if the Walmart thing got turned down, then all eyes were going to be looking at the city to say, okay, well, now what are you going to do? And then there'd be some of that free money available mm-hmm. that gets criticized. And to a certain extent that happened. As a taxpayer, I'm not unhappy with the amounts that, that are involved in that. And I, and I know that that property had some issues that needed to be to be addressed. Mm-hmm. But um, given what Walmart was offering, Nobody else was going to come in and offer anything else until they got shot down, uh, and it got kind of complicated. But um, you know, there there were responsibilities to the bank, and it, it was very complicated, right? Absolutely. So, like, I I know people on both sides of every side of that issue, mm-hmm. and uh, including myself. And it, it's not as black and white. I don't love Walmart. I don't know of anybody who is passionate about Walmart. Oh, it's an it's the truth is. I mean, I think a lot of people wish we still had our 
Mayberry's in existence with our small town general stores, but the truth is Walmart. Walmart's here. We have multiple locations in the right. greater Green Bay area, and it's a certainly. I think, I think it's a. That's a very what you. So said my is very question on that was uh, something that you think that they did well, and you think that how that was overall handled. They by shooting at the Walmart down. You think that that was handled well. I think I think the fact that we we held out and that we had leadership with a real vision for the city to again a higher ceiling for potential not not necessarily accepting the a consolation prize thinking bigger and better for the city which i i do believe the transfer to ddl holdings i mean this is here we went with proven local talent folks responsible for the award-winning title town brewing after all yeah how you can't be excited about that proposing 30 million in tax base versus nine i think that's for me, I thought that was a no-brainer, and uh, I know my it was one issue. It was something I raised at our forum as my opponent actually abstained from the vote. Was the only person who abstained from that transfer, and given their track record, I don't see how one could not be excited and encouraged about what they're about to undertake. So the way that it all panned out, I think most people are super excited about what they're planning there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, can you? And yep, you're you're watching the clock. I see. I see it too. So. Uh, where do you think that city council came up short in the past? Well, I I haven't been I haven't been one of the individuals to run a whole lot of my campaign on the whole. A lot of people are throwing the word civility out there, code of conduct, things things along those lines. That really hasn't been one of the major tenets of my campaign. I've really tried to focus on substantive issues because I believe there are a whole heck of a lot of them for the city. That being said, the professionalism of our city council is important in, for many reasons. Um, it can't be underscored that it's not just the residents of Green Bay that watch our city, uh, that follow things going on. It's the prospective CEO who may be looking to inquire about relocating a business is watching Green Bay. And ultimately, my opinion on the code of conduct was you know, ultimately, I'm a believer in the democratic process. I mean, there will be debate and there will be some rancor in the democratic process. Ultimately, I think it's incumbent on voters to educate themselves and elect people that, similar to what I am promising, I will work professionally with everyone but be beholden to no one. And I think that's the kind of mindset that we need. I would fiercely disagree with someone on but one the, the, issue. Doesn't everybody say that, though? Well, but I, I think there's, a, again, when you get people with who are more focused on um, their own personal issues and personal ambitions, um, I think that does become problematic in the council. I mean, again, how does it look to the prospective CEO of a business thinking about inquiring in Green Bay when you have the city council president, you know, accusing, insinuating in the Press Gazette that the mayor's chiefly running for office to snap a longevity streak uh, or that, again, he doesn't care about the downtown. I mean, this is a city council president saying this. This isn't some – that's something that you would expect from some armchair alderman angrily blogging on the Press you, Gazette. So uh, do you think there should be term limits? I don't believe so. I think I think it's, it's important that – that rests with the voters. There are some people who have been in the city council for a long time that clearly receive a very commanding amount of their constituents' votes. And I think if it's not one of the things I've tried to run on about, you know, there's some people who like to run on the anti-incumbent platform. This guy's been in office too long. You know, some people do vote against a person for that reason. But again, I think, I think that kind of marginalizes and cheapens a lot of the important issues that we have in our city. I, I go back to the fact that, again, we're this isn't small town politics. We're a city of 100,000, and we, we spend $100 million annually. So I would, I would not be in favor of term limits for city council. Okay. So short answer, um, what is a, a big idea that you have, something that you think our city needs that, that nobody's talking about? Well, I think we need to as a city, again, ask ourselves, how are we going to maintain our tax base? How are we going to help people with property taxes? I had a friend move into the city from Minnesota. He's paying twice the amount for the same priced assessed home in Green Bay as that other city. I think we need to ask ourselves very 
kind of holistically, what is it? How do we recruit people? How do we bring folks to Green Bay? It's 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 meeting all the needs. It's just not bringing in businesses, but it's having those quality of life issues, the quality of life enhancers, the environmental enhancers in the city to attract people. And and I think again, we have to look at our downtown as being such a great source for our tax base. I haven't heard many people talk about the fact that the title town district is coming in, and that's where I really the last thing we would want is our downtown and our tax base to take a step back with the emergence of the title town district. And I th- I don't think both are each other's success is diametrically opposed. I think both can thrive off one another. The old notion of building a sale, so to speak, where with the title town district, maybe someone will stay three days in Green Bay in the Green Bay area as opposed to two, they might spend one evening downtown Green Bay. I think that's something that we we need leadership who says, how do we keep not just a vibrant, thriving and expanding downtown, but a thriving, viable and vibrant Green Bay at large? Okay, one other short question and then we'll be done. Uh, what would you cut? Again, with regard to cutting, I, I think my biggest approach would just be look at the look at necessity versus luxury. Look at projects and say what so do we no, actually there's need. There's no pet thing that you think that was a mistake. We should cut that, or there's a department that you think is wasteful. Nothing like no, that I off th- the top of your head. I think we provide great services in this city. That's a fact. But I think what we need to do is rather than discuss cutting, we need to say how do we maintain. How do we maintain those okay. great services? Okay. Uh, all right. The election is April 5th. Yes. And that's a Tuesday. That's a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that's coming up pretty soon. We're recording this on March 18th. Hopefully we'll get that out pretty quick. Um, any? Uh, how, how, how would you like people to get in contact with you? Or you know, do you well, have a website, Facebook? Yes. You know, any of Facebook, that stuff? it would be facebook.com slash Evan, E-V-A-N, for F-O-R, Green Bay. And the email address is... Evan for Green Bay at gmail.com. Okay. And again, you're running for city council district to east side of Green Bay, and everybody should get out and vote April 5th. Absolutely. Anyone listening who's undecided, uh, I would welcome contact. I, I feel so strongly in what we're capa- what vision we're offering, what we're really capable of doing in this city that anybody who's undecided or needs convincing, I, I invite you to contact me because I'm so passionate about this, and I think I think Green Bay's best days truly lie ahead. Excellent. And Evan Hutsack. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to run over to iTunes and Stitcher and give a rating and review of the show. It helps other people find us. Cheers.